question we're looking to answer over the next 45 minutes is whether customer experience is the ultimate effectiveness driver. And again, we'll be looking at how you can optimize investment in customer experience to drive business performance. And then we're going to be looking at how, in practice, marketing, you as marketers, can join up with different functions to deliver that in practice. I'm going to kick things off and just going to headline some latest research we've been doing this in, in this area and around that topic. And I'm delighted also to have Nathan and Jeremy, who are going to share some great examples of how they've put that into practice in their organizations. And then what we hope to do at the end is a little Q&A where you'll get the opportunity to ask the guys some probing questions. So we thought, what better way to start up a rigorous analysis of this topic around customer experience and the effectiveness of it than with a singing safety jovial video from Virgin America. So I'm going to show you 20, 20 seconds of this. I got some safety tips that you got to know. And trust me, it's something that you want to hear. So honey, zip your lips and in your show before we move into the stratosphere. Yeah. So I want to hold up for your seatbelt, pull it down tight, and keep your hook in that chair. Okay, love to show you the whole thing. Not sure it would answer our question around effectiveness if I did. So why am I showing you that? So the reason is Virgin uh, America is a growth-driving org organization that's winning at the customer experience. They're making flying good again across the customer experience. And absolutely, they invest in really effective communications and content. You might have seen their Blar Airlines uh, campaign, an online campaign centered around a six-hour uh, video of a really boring flight with mannequins to show how dull that is versus Virgin America. If you've got six hours, go and have a look at that on YouTube. Um, but equally, as well as communications and content, they've invested across all aspects of the customer experience to drive growth. And it's happened through marketing, working with different functions to reinvent the experience. So for example, the booking experience, they created the first ever responsive airline website. Uh, on flights, you've not only got on-demand menus, you've got the singing safety video, but you've also got a personalized entertainment system that not only provides you with beverage and entertainment choices based on your previous preferences, but also enables you to converse with teams on the ground around any issues you've got in real time. So, for example, meeting, connecting flights. Uh, and finally, what they do really effectively is they focus on their people. Virgin's renowned for this overall, and they empower their people through the values, heartfelt service, the culture, but also equipping them to use their creativity uh, to be able to deliver in the moment what they call instant service recovery. And Virgin America is one of the companies we've been looking at, one of these growth-driving organizations, as part of a, a series of studies we've done over the last 18 months. So I'm just going to headline those now to set up the context for Nathan and Jeremy's session. So um, the first of these was a study called Growth Drivers, and this looked at the characteristics uh, of organizations and the practices to be able to drive growth in today's world. And we, we talk about growth drivers being companies with a track record of over 6% growth over the past three years, and also there's confidence in their ability to fu meet future goals. And what we found from this was that customer experience, a joined up, differentiated customer experience, was a top hallmark of growth driving organizations versus laggards. You can see the stats here, joined up customer experience strategies, focusing your structures and ways of working around the end-to-end -end customer experience. Now, we all work in the industry, so we'll be familiar with why this is the case. Empowered by information and technology, customers are incredibly uncompromising. They demand an outstanding experience through every single interaction. So it's not just communications, it's the product experience, it's service, it's sales, every single interaction they have. If you get it right, it's going to drive loyalty, it's going to drive advocacy, purchase intent, higher prices, and as we can see here, growth. But if you get it wrong, um, you're going to lose customers, and you're not going to achieve your growth, uh, growth uh, priorities. So to be able to do this, however, is really tough. It's really challenging, because we're talking about every single interaction. Marketing can't do this alone. It needs to join up with different functions to be able to do this in practice. And it's also got to be differentiated um, in, in order to achieve your growth ambitions. So we decided to dig a little bit deep into this, and we've got a new report, it's out next week, which looks at specifically how marketing can work with different functions to deliver outstanding customer experiences. So we went out, we, we, we interviewed uh, leading companies, the likes of Virgin, First Direct, Unilever, PepsiCo, Nationwide, M&S. We also looked out of sector and looked at some businesses around how you break down silos. So we talked about Williams Formula One. Uh, we spoke to also the United Nations. We thought it'd be good to get those on our, on our side. Um, uh, and then we also looked at the quantitative uh, data as well with contributors from over 1,000 
uh, people from different companies across, uh, across 42 different countries. So what I'm going to just do now, and, and there's a huge amount of report here that we're not going to be able to show you, I'm just literally going to headline in one chart what we learnt and what the key drivers are for these growth driving organisations. And what we learnt overall is that actually there's a lot of work to do. Only uh, less than one in three organisations are highly joined up currently across their strategies and activities in their business. And with, if I group the, three, the key challenges into three key areas, in strategy, still far too siloed, far too rigid, far too focused on today's pain points, the short-term gains versus longer-term opportunities to create real value. Secondly, despite the constant reorganizational structures um, to address silos, it's just creating more silos. There's still massive silos in, in ways of working between different functions. We're not addressing how people need to work in practice to deliver better for customers. And thirdly, there's still a failure by businesses to empower their people across the organization. Uh, and the employee experience is absolutely critical to the quality of your customer experience. So what did we learn about what growth driving organizations do differently? Well, what we found was marketing is working with other functions in the organization through co-invention. So they're not just focusing on the short-term pain points. They're looking to reinvent aspects of the customer experience, invent experiences that haven't existed before, and through doing so, breaking down silos and creating new value for all. And there's three key drivers I'm just going to highlight. They each start with an I, um, uh, which is handy. Um, and the first of those is around invention and strategy and execution. So as we saw with Virgin America, there's marketing working with different functions to invent customer experiences that haven't existed before. And through doing so, they're not focusing on the, just the pain points, the short-term issues in the customer journey. They're identifying those passion points for customers that are going to create future value and drive business performance. And they do that by inventing the future experience first and then working back. And it's that shared inventiveness drives a shared ownership amongst cross-functional teams to deliver a great customer experience. And because invention, invention is about iteration, right? So they're not just kind of resting on their laurels. They're then looking to continuously improve the micro moments across the customer experience by applying the data and the insights that it's telling us. So the invention is the first area, and we saw that with Virgin America. We saw how they reinvented the flying experience. They weren't just trying to deal with and fix with pain points. There's two other key eyes that we want to, want to um, share with you, which enable this invention in practice. The first of those is around integrating real working practices. Organizations are spending far too long focusing on the organogram, putting in more process. Actually, the businesses that are doing this really well understand their customers' real needs, not just the transactions they have with them. They understand what employees need. How does the real work get done in the business? And they integrate their working practices cross-functionally around um, uh, those needs. And marketing has an absolutely critical role to play here. Marketing is the customer champion. It can bring that insight into the business to enable this joined up way of working. If we look at a business like First Direct, they have pioneered amazing service for many years. And they do it through integrating working practices around the real needs of customers, but also their people. Their customer service teams are not guided by process manuals or by process. They're guided by empowered values, trusted to use their judgment in the moment. Uh, there's no need to refer upwards. There's no scripts. And they trust their, customer, uh, their, their people to deliver for customers in the right way. But equally so um, important is the ingenuity of people, harnessing the ingenuity of the people. So, and I, I think we've heard earlier about it today, uh, we're in the era of automation. Artificial intelligence is going to play a key role in business and enabling the customer experience. Well, what was really clear from the organizations winning at customer experience is that they harness the ingenuity of their people and they get their people through the culture for equipping them to ask the right questions of customers bring their creativity to deliver those solutions, enabled by the technology, and use their resourcefulness to amplify that across the business. And these kind of right side of the brain activities are even more important as some of the other tasks become more automated. So it's these three key eyes, invention, integration, ingenuity, that are really important. And, and Zappos is an example of an organization where you see that ingenuity in their people. So it's an online shoe retailer, but it's about delivering pu a purpose of happiness. And they empower people through their culture, deliver those wow moments. They've invested in their customer service teams versus um, those marketing campaigns necessarily and just focusing on those. And, and so it's these three eyes together that are absolutely critical to delivering a differentiated customer experience. So 
that's what we learned in, in, in kind of headlines from uh, the latest research we've done and talking from, to organizations from our own experience working with these organizations. But you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, how do we put this into practice? Because it can sound easy on screen, but how do we make this happen in practice? So that's when I'm going to call upon, first of all, Nathan Ansell from MS to talk about his experience uh, within his organization. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, okay, so two seconds just on me. So my background, um, uh, predominantly a psychologist, I suppose that's what I trained as initially, uh, moved into um, FMCG marketing, so I spent about 10, 12 years um, training as a relatively traditional FMCG marketer, and I've moved um, onto the retail side, so I've worked for M&S um, for about four years. And I kind of see my role as taking a lot of the principles um, that a lot of you will be familiar with from FMCG and applying them um, almost on speed, actually, um, in a retail um, environment. Um, I guess the purpose of the next sort of 10 minutes or so is to persuade you that customer experience is not only important, um, but it can make a substantial difference to your, to your bottom line. Hopefully I'll pick up on some of the themes um, that Rich, Rich talked about. Um, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is just cast your mind back to uh, 2012. So um, back in 2012, the, the macro competitive um, environment in retail, particularly in food retail, was incredibly tough. Um, we were beginning to question whether we were going to go through another double dip, uh, a double dip recession, so another recession uh, environment. The discounters for us were clearly um, incredibly um, aggressive as, as, as they are. And so that the environment, um, as it always is, um, was very, very tough. And we'd been developing, our team had been developing a, a new purpose, which was to make every food moment special. And that was the, and I'll talk a little bit more um, about what that means um, as we go through. Um, my team's role was to not only deliver all of our standards of the marketing output, but also embed, um, embed that purpose in the organization and actually to work out sort of what it, what it means um, for us. Um, the, the business challenge that we face is all about frequency. So a um, little bit of context, our, our food business um, is um, you know, been very successful over a period of time, largely by building a frequency behavior amongst customers. You know, most people shop at M&S at some point um, in any given year, but quite a lot of them come in to us for special occasions, whether it be one of their birthdays or Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, or so on and so forth. So our job, really, as a, as a team, um, as a cross-functional team, is to become more relevant more often and therefore drive frequency um, with customers so they come in to us um, more often and effectively sort of still, still trips um, from, from the marketplace. And the way I want to talk to you about today is that we did that was really through driving a, a seamless customer experience to make sure that once someone had made that trip, they wanted to come back again and again um, to M&S. Um, the first thing we did um, was actually with, with the, with the, with the cross-functional team, and this touches on some of the points that, that Rich made around sort of how marketing can play a role in getting real cross-functional uh, alignment, is actually to look back. So we went up, so we've got an amazing archive up in, up in Leeds um, where we've got all sorts of things from the history of the, of the company. And we look back and we said, well, look, if we want to make every food, every food special in the future, how have we done that um, in the past and what have we done? And what we discovered was, and you won't be able to read all this um, from, from there, but there's a very, very rich history in the organization, which sometimes we'd forgotten, actually, um, around the things that we'd done. So back in 1929, being the first to ever do cut sandwiches in store, for example, in the, Edge, in the Edgware Road store, um, we invented Best Before Dates in 1972, effectively invented um, the prepared meal, and a whole bunch of other things we'd done um, to make the customer um, experience um, special. And, and going through that process right from the outset of looking back um, to our history was incredibly powerful um, for us, actually, and a great alignment moment um, for the, for the cross-functional team. Um, but the, 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 the challenge then was to say, well, what does that mean um, for us going forward? And we spent quite a bit of time, actually, with um, trading teams, uh, buying teams, uh, product development teams, and so on and so forth. So well, what is it? What is it that makes M&S special as a food retailer in the UK? And what we sort of discovered, which in some degrees, in retrospect, sounds obvious, is um, there are kind of two types of retailer when it comes to food um, in the UK. One is um, you've got a sort of the highly specialist retailers, so um, retailers who sell things that are perhaps um, from you know, specialist farms, perhaps a slightly higher price point, um, things that are more unique um, and special and, and, and tend to be visited less frequently. 
Then you've got supermarkets, um, which are obviously very high frequency spend in areas where you spend £150 on a full grocery shop. And what we realised was what was special about um, M&S is that we have the, 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 the passion uh, of a specialist retailer um, and, and customers could sense that when they walked in the door, but the proximity of the supermarket. So we were sort of around the corner um, uh, from, from, the, from, from most of our customers most of the time. Um, and that led us to a very simple phrase that we adopted, which is that we're a food hall um, for all. So we wanted to retain a certain element of democracy, but also a, a degree of specialness. And that was sort of a, a, bit, a bit of a tipping point, actually, in terms of taking the business purpose of making every food moment special and working out what that might mean um, for customer, uh, customer experience. And the, the concept of food hall was something that we'd written above the bulkheads in our stores for many, many years. It wasn't a new, a new thought but we'd never really imbued it with any sense of meaning. So we saw Food Hall as a sort of empty vessel that we could fill with whatever values we, we chose to. So we defined some really clear values for the organisation as we went through 2012, 2013. And first of all, we said, you know, a Food Hall is a creative director and curator um, of its own range. So we don't tend to sell very many of other, other people's products. So we sell some, um, some brands, but 95% of what we sell, in fact, more than that, is in the food hall is, is our, own, our own products. We create them ourselves, and there's a huge, incredible creative enterprise in the organization making this stuff, actually. It's a very creative place to, to work and to, and to be. So we, we sort of create and curate um, our own range. Um, we're a place of innovation and discovery, so we have about 7,000 products, about 1,500 uh, are new um, every, every year, but we weren't doing a good enough job in bringing those, that innovation to life and making sure it's front and centre of what we were doing. We wanted to be known as a place for innovation and discovery. Um, food halls have passion and expertise at our heart, so again, being in the organisation, you get a real sense of passion, excitement and energy that wasn't always translating as well as it could have done um, in, in the store environment and through things like advertising. Um, obviously a place to discover the best of season, so making sure that we have freshness is absolutely at the top of the agenda and owning the category benefit um, of freshness. Um, and making freshness an experience as well. So we set about doing all sorts of things, you know, putting more delis into store, putting more bakeries, making them front and centre, increasing the range, giving it display outside of um, its core categories and so on and so forth, and making freshness um, an experience. And we put you know, hundreds of tasting stations in store. So if you've been into m s Food Hall recently, chances are someone offered you something to try um, from one of the new ranges, and they're cooking it um, in front of you in store. But really importantly, um, we believe that the best taste shouldn't be the preserve of a few. So we never wanted to be uh, perceived as being sort of too, too high-end and too much for high days and holidays. We wanted to retain that element of, uh, of democracy. And just picking up on some of the things that, that Rich said, we spent a lot of time as a, as a cross-functional team talking about how we get that done, how we make that happen um, in the organisation. So um, working through strategically, how we were setting strategy as a leadership team um, in the food group, but also thinking about how we execute that strategy and making sure we lined ourselves up for success. And you know, this is an example of the taste, um, taste range of where we completely changed our model from having very, very set sub-brands in the range to having more of an umbrella branding proposition that we allow us to bring in new cuisines, new flavours on a very regular basis without disrupting the space range and display plan. And only by working in a very cross-functional way um, can we make that happen. We introduced a, a, a brand new process, isn't very exciting, but a brand new process called Business Planning Week, which enabled us as a, as a cross-functional team across the entire organisation to work much better together to deliver the experience in a much more joined-up way um, for customers. Um, and then the final piece, which sort of aims slightly at, uh, at sort of market marketeers in the room, is you know, retailers, like many organisations, are a bit of a juggernaut. And you know, kind of my one bit of advice would be, don't get in the way of the juggernaut. You know, find a way of enabling the organisation to be fleet and fast thinking, but at the same time plan ahead, because actually delivering a great customer experience does require a greater degree of planning um, than most retailers would be um, would be used to. Um, but the, the, sort of the, the sort of secret source came in two, two areas, really. First and foremost, um, the ingenuity um, of our people. So we took every customer assistant on a sort of two-hour, um, almost like a boot camp, really, to really understand what it was we were trying to achieve in making every few moments special, what it meant for our store teams, what it meant for our customers, and how we wanted customers to feel um, leaving our store. And we went through every element of the customer experience and defined exactly how we wanted it to, to, to feel for them. And I don't say we always get it right, um, but I feel like having that sort of buy-in and creating a movement um, at the grassroots level was incredibly important with our 80,000 um, employees. 
and then you can see how we brought it to life. So one of the one of the key things we did actually was we used to call our food hall Simply Foods, where we sort of ripped down the branding on the outside of the store, um, and we renamed all of our food halls food halls because that's where we wanted to be. And we, we we looked at every element of the customer experience in the store. Um, we erected some behind the behind the checkouts, very very visual for for, for customers. Um, some key areas where we could bring to life visuals of our food, but also statements about what we stood for and what we what we valued um, as a as a as a brand and as an organisation. Um, and I can't show you the numbers on this chart, so it's slightly irritating. We're on a quiet period at the moment, but it's safe to say we we, we were um, very pleased um, with the results. So NPS um, jumped by nearly 20%. Um, over the three-year three period to, to what I would consider now to be a sort of world-class MPS. We saw very big jump, double-digit jumps in things like um, inspiring place to shop um, and as well as easy to shop, actually, because that's very important, particularly for some of our missions related to sort of uh, shorter-term top-up shops. Um, we've seen like-for-like -like growth now for about 28 quarters, almost straight um, like-for-like -like growth ahead of the market, uh, which is fantastic. But the most pleasing thing for me um, was the jumps we saw in employee engagement. So we measure employee engagement through something called the All Say Survey. And we had a nearly a 40% jump in employee engagement because it really, the, the, the process we'd gone through really gave people a sense of purpose um, and belief in what we were trying to do. So that's it. Hopefully in 10 minutes I've, I've managed to persuade you that the customer experience not only is important, um, but is also profitable. Um, and I'll hand over now to, uh, to Jeremy. Okay, afternoon everybody. Um, it's actually interesting watching Nathan's slides. It almost kind of replaced my pictures with Nathan's pictures and tell a very, very similar story. So uh, I'm the Marketing Customer Experience Director for TUI UK and Ireland. Uh, I've been with the company for 25 years, uh, which is a real rarity, I think, these days. I think those, those two elements of my title, Marketing and Customer Experience, are quite interesting uh, looking back over the 25 years and the changes that I've seen in the business. Because I would argue that marketing... Um, and talking about this morning's session around creativity perhaps hasn't changed as much um, in that time, but, but the customer experience definitely has. Uh, and I would argue that certainly in the last five years, which is what I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes talking about, uh, that's what's driven uh, the performance of our business more than anything else. So um, just a quick recap on travel. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how quickly things are changing. So... You go back to the early days when suddenly travel became accessible by uh, new innovation in travel. Uh, then you get into the um, kind of middle of the last, uh, the last century where suddenly it became available to the masses. Uh, and I came into the business at the end of this period where uh, it was a real pile them high, sell them cheap, uh, you know, cram people into buses and into aircraft and into hotels. Uh, and it was a pretty uncomfortable time. Uh, and we carry that legacy with us. But you get into an age where suddenly um, the consumer gets a lot of power through the internet and through digital technology. And that was just exacerbated again uh, by obviously uh, user-generated content uh, and social influence. And as a vertically integrated tour operator, this posed a real challenge to us because I hate the expression, but everybody uses it, disintermediation. Suddenly, uh, us as a tour operator putting together packages, people could do it themselves. And that was a real issue for us. So the big question for us uh, about five or so years ago was, well, how do we reinvent um, what we do to make it relevant to the modern-day customers? And there was a really interesting quote. I was reading this book by Dave Trott um, recently called uh, One Plus One Equals Three. I'm sure many of you have read it. But the one thing, the one chapter in it that really stood out to me, which is, uh, what are your competitors not doing? And how do you then tackle that issue uh, to become unique and create your own differentiated position? And that's arguably what we've done. So we started uh, as a package holiday company, and arguably we still are. Um, but it was kind of you know, the benefit of going on a package. If you ask people why go on a package, they'll say it's easy. And there's real value in that. It's a nice, simple purchase. Uh, everything's done for you end to end. But it has this downside of being very impersonal. One size fits all, single model. Uh, and people really started to get away from that as the new world of doing it yourself came in. Suddenly, I can start to do things in the way that I want. Uh, I've got power back. Um, I can make things more authentic, more individual. Uh, and to a degree, I can potentially get a better price. And customers are faced with this dilemma. Do I go package or do I go independent? And we think what people are not doing is a real opportunity for us because with this dilemma, it creates actually an opportunity. Can we do the best of both? In an age where we can really leverage customer experience, digital technology, and our human touch, married 
with our vertical integration throughout the whole customer value chain, if we can use customer experience to start to differentiate and personalize, as well as making things easy, we think we can almost create our own category. And that's where we're working towards uh, today. Where we've seen the best results in this actually was a strategy that we'd adopted many years ago, but just hadn't kind of framed in, in, in that way, which is we, we've started to um, take the standard customer experience and differentiate it in different ways for different kind of customers. And we've created what we call holiday concepts, which um, we take specific hotels and we put in a specification that designs an experience to meet that sector's need. So we have a luxury sector, we have a family sector, we have a couple sector, we have a club sector, and these products have got names. And those differentiated products now, those hotel concepts, are the core of what we do. And, and what's, uh, what's really key is that the proof is in the pudding, uh, an expression already used by Nathan, that we're seeing better NPS, uh, because obviously we're designing experiences that match people's needs, and as a result of that, better retention, and as a result of that, better profit. So these experiences are clearly driving uh, much better customer engagement. And we didn't stop there. We said, well, actually, the hotel is only part of what we do. As a vertically integrated company, owning the booking process all the way through to the holiday and the return process, there's a lot more that we need to do. So from NPS analysis and regression, we said, what other parts of the customer journey do we need to, to, do we need to affect? So um, we took our flights and we said, you know what? Uh, putting people onto the standard planes is not enough. Uh, we need to really up our ante with the experience. So we invested um, hundreds of billions, uh, which is quite a lot of money, uh, in new 787 Dreamliners. Uh, we've now got about 13 in the fleet, and we've got a whole set of uh, 737 Maxes coming uh, in the next uh, sort of five years or so. And this is where, again, we started to really up the ante in terms of designing experiences around customers. So better technology, uh, better environment in flying, better seat comfort, so we had uh, greater pitch in economy and premium economy than BA and Virgin. So really trying to up the ante. And then we thought, hang on a minute, we're doing all this great stuff. We need to tell people about it. So in 2012, we started to communicate the differences that we'd, made, that we'd started to make. And this is just an ad from back then that, that was the launch of the Dreamliner. Remember those first steps abroad. Your first glimpse of sunny shores. And your first sangria. What fun we had. And we're bringing you another first. We've a new way to travel on our holidays. With more space and comfort. It makes flying a dream. The new Thompson Dreamliner. So really the purpose of showing that is that we, we had to have the experience before we started communicating it. And that's one of the key things um, I'd like to sort of um, reiterate through, throughout the presentation. Um, you, you've, you've got to set your stall out and then live up to what, what you communicate. And obviously having something that was that, that big, that big investment, it was a real opportunity to state how we were changing. Another part of the value chain, and actually one of the biggest drivers of MPS in our business is not the hotel experience, it's actually the booking process um, that comes back to our brand. And if you go back again to the time uh, of the 80s and the 90s, and arguably the early noughties, um, the booking process was pretty grim. You'd walk into a travel agent that looked pretty messy, um, and you, you'd basically use it as a, as a kind of... Um, uh, a trading conversation. It wasn't so much about getting inspired about travel. It was what sort of discount can I get on my holiday? And we said, you know, this is just not good enough. If we're trying to sell these amazing experiences, these hotel experiences and these flight experiences, we've got to bring these experiences to people on the high street. So we converted, um, again, through regression analysis, um, we converted our sales centers into brand experiences on the high street. So we've now got 43 uh, holiday design stores across the country, which cost 
anything from, I'd say, 50 grand up to half a million to, to invest in. This is a Blue Water store, um, which is one of our biggest, um, to bring the whole day to life using di digital de technology. But it's not just about the digital, it's also about people. And what we did a lot of work with around experiences, how do we want our staff to behave and what are the conversations we want them to have with our customers? So, for example, typically a customer would come into a shop and our agent would say, uh, hello, Mr. Jones, um, where would you like to go on holiday? Which puts the emphasis back on the customer to think about what they want. What we now do is to say, hello, Mr. Jones, come and have a seat. Tell us about your favourite holiday. What's, you know, what, what's your happiest memory of holiday? And suddenly they open up with the things that they feel really positive about. We then digest that. They're interested in this and that and the other. And then we, through our education and our knowledge, can start to suggest holidays that we think are fairly similar to what they've uh, really enjoyed in the past. And we call it getting customers into their happy place. So it's about changing the conversation, a much, much softer thing than a great big 787, but still a vitally important part of, of, our, of our customer experience. And what we saw is that the shops that had the most, uh, the, the sort of best response in Mystery Shopper from a service point of view were the ones that were most exceeding their sales target. And so again, we talked about sales through service, not just about sales. The, more, the, the better you can make customers feel, feel when they actually sit down and talk to you, the more likely you are to get better sales from them. And we didn't stop there. So uh, when we go overseas, um, and actually the post-booking and pre-departure phase, where we had little contact with customers, we've now started to give them technology that allows them to really indulge in their holiday. So it's about getting prepared before they go, uh, and actually really enjoying uh, the activity um, and, and indulging in their holiday. And who knows where the future will be? So with virtual reality, um, with chatbots, et cetera, this is all stuff that we're starting to play around with in our innovation lab. We think we can really take the customer experience further through digital technology. And I would say, when often you're kind of balancing these investments around, do I spend more money in marketing or in distribution or in product or experience? For me, it's the product and the experience, and certainly in TUI's experience, that's made the biggest difference. And now perhaps we can spend more in marketing and in distribution uh, to actually bring that experience to life. And the other thing that's really important to remember is what are your funding mechanisms? If you want to invest um, in big aircraft or in new shops or whatever it may be, what can you stop doing in your customer experience that customers don't value that allows you to fund uh, these investments? Uh, and I think that's a, a really critical thing uh, in, the, in the whole customer experience process. Proofs in the pudding, an expression used already. Uh, we've seen tremendous uh, growth in terms of our brand index from YouGov uh, since 2012 to today. Uh, also in terms of our value perception. So even though we've invested more and our holiday prices have gone up, our value perception has increased significantly, both for the Thompson and the First Choice brands. Likewise for satisfaction and recommendation. Both have increased significantly since we started to really invest in the customer experience. Uh, and then finally, uh, and quite simply, the business numbers speak for themselves. So we've seen an increase in 10% uh, of NPS in that time. We've seen retention increase by 5%. Uh, we've seen a doubling in, in profit uh, and a significant increase in revenue. But interestingly, our volume hasn't increased a great deal, which means we're extracting an awful lot more value out of existing customers or the same customer base. And the next stage is obviously to start growing the, uh, the, the top line significantly more through, through growth. So for me, the customer experience has made the biggest difference in the last five years. Thank you. I'll invite Rich back up for the... Okay, so for the last few minutes, it would be just great to get a few questions from the audience. Having heard a couple of great case studies around how marketing can focus on the customer experience to deliver business impact. So I'd just like to open up to questions from the audience. Any questions people have for either Nathan or Jeremy? We've got a question with a gentleman uh, over here. Yeah, I, I just had a question representing the agencies to ask what, what, what role did agencies play versus what role uh, the, the, uh, you played as an organization? Jeremy, do you want to Yeah, I can. Um, the, the, the agencies actually played quite an important role in, in a way in terms of, uh, on, on two fronts. One is about understanding the, the wider business strategy um, in, in terms of where the brand needs to head, um, which funnels down into not just the communication side, but also the experience side. So, 
Um, you know, we, we've, we've used various agencies to help us uh, understand the data, um, understand what customer experience um, activities that we should be adopting across the business. Um, and then obviously there's the creative side, which is how do you bring that to life and tell your story? And I think those two things have to work together. And often when we're, when we're looking at brand strategy and customer experience strategy, we'll, we'll have um, more than one agency in the room at the same time helping us define what that looks like. I suppose uh, cr critical, critical import, um, important part. So a lot of the stuff that you, you see out there has come from work we've done with our, with our agencies. I suppose the f what I always say to Tim is don't, we shouldn't think of our agencies as agencies, if you know what I mean. I know it sounds obvious, but you know, we, we make a, a point of having our agencies physically with us in the office as much as possible um, and working in collaboration. So the integration stuff I talked about in terms of cross-functional integration within the food leadership team is as important that we replicate that similar sort of model um, with our agency partners as well. So that would be, be my response to that. Hi, John Bradley from the ICA in Canada. Uh, can I ask Nathan that the, the more you improve the food experience, because Marks and Spencer's doesn't just sell food, does that create an experience gap in the store itself? Does it make it harder to sell knickers and raincoats? <laughs> no, but, but, but we, but we recognise, I mean, we've, you know, Steve, our CEO, has been on, on record saying that we've got a job to do um, in, in driving our customer experience. So, um, you know, Steve was very clear when he took over as CEO back in April. His number one priority um, was to drive customer experience across the organisation. That's absolutely critical. And my role um, more recently has expanded to, to, to work across both the food side of the business and, and, and across clothing and home as well um, internationally. So that's a key priority for us is making sure that we, um, we really up our game um, in experience across all parts of um, a parts of MS and I've, in Marble Arch on the way here this morning, um, I feel like we're making some really good progress um, in that area, but we recognise there's, there's probably a bit more to do um, on the clothing side of the business than perhaps we've, um, we have on food. Okay, we might just try and sneak one final question because this gentleman over here wanted to ask one. <coughs> I wanted to ask you, you obviously, and it's particularly to you because I've a bit more background in um, travel, but that's a huge amount of investment. How big was the challenge to get the business to invest in the customer experience versus perhaps what it might more obviously have felt that it wanted to do in terms of promotion? Yeah, I think it, um, it partly depends on which bit of the customer experience as well, because clearly invested in hundreds of billions of pounds into new aircraft is... I, would, I wouldn't say it's a customer experience dilemma. It's kind of, you know, you, you, it's, it's a kind of leap of faith to a degree in that you know you need to, to move, on, move on. With the shops, I think, was an interesting one because um, I, I made a real case for saying we needed to change the brand image on the high street because it was just starting to detract customers from walking in the store. Uh, and this was a big debate with the retail guys saying, yeah, but... We have to have cards in the window to, you know, to, to encourage people to walk in and, and have these conversations. It wasn't until we started testing stuff where we said, look, let's make the windows much more cleaner with, with brand statements. And, I, and actually, ironically, people started to walk into the store to say, where are your discounts? And suddenly we started opening up conversations. But we proved through, through those conversations and changing the, the way that we service customers, as I mentioned in the presentation, that the numbers improved. So we kind of trialled it uh, and then said, you know what, this is actually driving better sales, therefore we can afford the investment. So typically the investment is done through a, a business case, which we have to prove through, through modelling it. Sometimes it, you know, it's, it's a case of um, y y there's still a leap of faith because you want to do it at scale, and, and often these tests you know, are kind of, you, you can't do those things at, at scale, but typically it, it's around a business case. And we haven't actually changed our marketing investment that much in this time, but we have significantly changed the investment in the customer experience. So test and learn. Yes. Nathan? Okay, okay. so that's a fantastic uh, way to end today's session. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Nathan. And uh, we'll close there. Thank you. Thank you.